Welcome to another episode of the Gay Archive Show, where we explore gay history one bar at a time. I'm your host, Art Smith, and today's special guest is Juan Cesar, spotlight operator at Charlie Brown's Cabaret in Backstreet Atlanta, and the founder and lead singer for the synth pop band Frisky Monkey. You started in the bar business at Backstreet, correct? Yep, Backstreet was the first bar I worked at. And, and the first job I did there was working Spotlight for the show upstairs. In Charlie Brown's Cabaret? Yes. So you had a long-time interaction with quite a number of the performers there at Charlie Brown's Cabaret. Yep. Um, when I first started doing the Spotlight, it was because Monty Raven was in the show. And since I was going to be there anyway, I was like, well, let me do Spotlight. And back then, the cast was like Ziggy Stardust and Leah Stetson and a bunch of people that, you know, I saw a lot of different cast changes through the years, definitely. Now, was Backstreet your first experience with a large-scale gay bar, or had you been to other big gay bars before then? Backstreet was definitely the biggest gay bar I'd ever been to. <laughs> um, and, yeah, that was the first one, definitely. So how did that impact your experience of kind of coming out and being able to be openly gay uh, being exposed to an environment like that? It was great. I mean, you know, because that was like early 90s, like 90, 91, for me at least. And um, there was nothing like it. It was just this amazing wonderland, you know, with so many things happening on different floors from that amazing dance floor on the, you know, the lowest tier to the show. I'd never seen a show until I saw Charlie Brown's Cabaret. And I was like, whoa, this is amazing, <laughs> you know, so. And I got to meet such, you know, as, as I started working there and even before I started working there, just going there with Raven, meeting people that I began to realize were legends already, you know, Charlie Brown, Lily White, um, Ziggy. So it was, for a young gay boy, it was like magic, it was heaven. I agree, I was right there with you. I had been to Backstreet for numerous years before you came into the scene, but um, it was the same way for me. I actually moved to Atlanta because of Backstreet. Oh, wow. Uh, if you read the article in Atlanta Magazine from last October uh, 2020 when they did that special pride section, one of the articles starts off by saying, Art Smith came to Backstreet uh, New Year's Eve, 1982-83, and he and his boyfriend Chris had such a fabulous time there that they decided to move to Atlanta a week later. Oh, wow. So yeah. it definitely had an impact on me as well, and mm -hmm. I would have to say, you know, you've been around the entertainment scene for a number of years now. Um, obviously, pegging that at 1990, we're talking about 30 plus years. Um, yeah. And you probably still don't see many shows that compare with the level of show that was performed at Backstreet at that time. I, I agree. And, you know, I say that to, like, I've got friends in my life now who have moved here recently, so they don't even know what Backstreet is. And I always try to explain to them, like, the wonder that was Backstreet and the uh, caliber of shows because I got spoiled. I I don't go to a lot of shows anymore just because I, I just don't. I mean, I, to me, you know, there'll never be another Raven, another Lauren the Masters, another Shauna Brooks, another Moshe, you know, another Ziggy Stardust. That's that's just upper echelon. Saison, <laughs> you know, back when she lived in Atlanta too, it's just like an Amber Richards, just all these legendary people that the kids have no clue about, you know, to a certain degree. Absolutely. And there yeah. were definitely some legends. I distinctly remember um, 
Raven. And as I recall, at that time frame, like 89, 90, um, when I first met Raven, I met Raven as Monty. And I, I, I don't think the Raven name was even there yet or had nope. the character hadn't been evolved. No, that would have been in 91. Like, I was there when the first night that he made his debut at Backstreet in the Thursday night talent show. Charlie Brown used to do a Thursday night talent show. And every week, and the winner of the weekly would get to perform on Friday nights with the big show. And then then the goal was at the end of a year, if I remember correctly, that person would become part of the cast. Raven won that Thursday. And I remember clearly what she did. She did Vanessa Williams run it back to you. She used to have red hair when she first started. And won, so Charlie brought her back that weekend for Friday and then asked her back for Saturday, which usually wasn't done. And then at the end of that Saturday, said you're disqualified from the show and put you in the regular cast from the, ta- from the contest. And thus began the, <laughs> the journey of Raven. <laughs> And of course, all of us who have ever seen uh, Raven perform, uh, wasn't her wasn't her nickname the Barbie Doll of the South or something like that? The, the Barbie Doll Lookalike of Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> um, but we all very vividly remember her fire act. Oh yes, amazing! And that was just mind blowing. I mean, it just stopped the entire house whatever whoever was packed into that room jaws dropped and eyes bulged out when that number was performed on the stage at backstreet yeah that's you know i think when anybody thinks of raven they're going to think of three things one is the fire act two is going to be her wonder woman and three is going to be the lucy in the sky um talent with the um you know, where she goes crazy and pulls her, pulls her hair out at the end and all that stuff. But the fire act was the number one thing. I mean, it was so ingrained into what she was, you know, from the fact that she did that song only, which was amazing. It's forever associated with the fire act. I, um, a couple of years ago, I was watching a show and a queen did that song. I was just going, why are you doing this to myself? And someone who, New Raven and worked in the cabaret with her, looked at me and goes, does she know that she shouldn't be doing this song? And I just kind of started laughing because it's a young queen. They have no clue. you know. Right. And that's part of the reason this project kind of got started. Um, you probably don't know this, but about a little over a year ago, about 15 months ago, I was having a conversation with some people in the back, the I Partied at Backstreet group on Facebook as well as Vicky Vera herself. And I was talking about, you know, the Backstreet days. And we came to the decision that I would make a commemorative t-shirt design based on the original Backstreet logo to honor the 45th year, uh, the 45th anniversary of the day that Backstreet opened. It opened in 1975 and 2020 would would have been the 45th year if they were still open. And so we made this shirt design, and I got such good feedback from people talking about, oh, this brings back so many memories, and oh my God, I love this, that I started researching other bars from back in my youth, and even beyond them, before them, um, and recreating the logos digitally, tracking them down whenever I could. And it built up to about five or six different designs by March, uh, mostly from Atlanta, Colorbox, Velvet, Rio, um, Texas Drilling Company. And then COVID hit. And when COVID came along, suddenly I, as so many other people in the world, uh, found myself with a lot of time where I couldn't do the things I normally did. You couldn't go out to dinner, you didn't go out to the malls or hang out in public or go have a drink at the bar. So I poured myself into this project and started researching all kinds of bars all over the country. And the the response has been great, but the reason behind it 
is because I was realizing that none of us are in our teens anymore. And all of these memories that we have, all of these fond things that we talk about from whether it's the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, about the heyday of our gay entertainment scene, the new younger people in their 20s and early 30s don't have a clue. And I wanted to help record that so that there would be a record of it so that they could at least see some of the, the memories that we had and preserve them. And Backstreet was certainly a big part of that. I mean, that place was just an amazing venue. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, you know, speaking of Vicky, I will always be grateful to her. She she allowed me to have my own show, which was unheard of for someone that didn't do drag, you know. And I got to do that show for close to seven years, I think about seven years, you know, on a Wednesday night because nobody wanted to take that night to do anything. Now, a lot of people who are going to be listening to this probably don't know, but... Uh, in addition to doing the light, lighting there at Backstreet, um, you have also evolved your own career as a singer and a member of a musical group called Frisky Monkey. That's correct, yep. And you're saying basically that that career evolved a little bit faster because of Backstreet's um, allowing you to perform there and, and Vicky Vera giving you support. Yeah, I mean, Vicky, yeah, if not for Vicky, allowing me to fly free, <laughs> you know, um, actually, let me, first, first things first, Charlie first gave me a spot letting me sing on Thursday nights, and that evolved into Vicky letting me have my own show, so I, I never want to not give Charlie her due, because, let's face it, without her, a lot of us wouldn't have had our start, but Vicky took a chance on me, you know, she could have had a drag queen host a Wednesday night show. And, but I pitched her the idea originally as a talent show. And then it kind of evolved because I realized that people weren't coming out for talent shows necessarily at 2 a.m. in the morning because, you know, Backstreet in the middle of the week didn't start till like 2 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> but I started having, because I knew all the queens at work there and around town, I'd have like a different weekly special guest and it started to pick up from that. So it eventually evolved into me and the cast and special guests. My first co-host, and I was known for giving newbies a break, their first start. So my first co-hostess was Nicole Page Brooks. So that's how she got her start in Atlanta. She'd been doing drag before she moved to Atlanta. So, so basically the whole energy of the Backstreet performance scene, um, with Charlie Brown doing her talent shows, you doing your Wednesday night shows, it was all sort of a family of people working to help each other instead of trying yeah. to outdo each other and just say, I'm the star and you're just, you know, eye candy mm -hmm. or whatever. It was definitely a family. I mean, it just, yeah, it just, all the girls that worked there were just lovely to me and always willing to work if I was, you know, putting on a benefit or anything like that. Um, I just, I don't know. I, I know I keep saying the word magical, but it really was a family of everyone there. You know, not only just because the entertainer section, but even the people that worked there, you know, bartenders, the door people, we all knew each other. We were a family. Now, you had a close relationship with Raven for a couple of years. You you followed her career closely and and were around for a lot of her experiences, correct? Yeah, we were um, we were dating uh, when she first started working at Backstreet, and we dated for about a year during that time, and then we became really good friends after that. Are you still friends? Oh yeah, <laughs> we still give each other shit um, via the phone or Facebook and things like that. Oh yeah, we still are. I will always. I will always defend Raven, you know, there's still some naysayers that you will occasionally run across that have things to say, but I always go, were you entertained by her? Oh, and absolutely. Yes. I'm like, well, it doesn't really matter what you think, you were still entertained by her. Right, <laughs> you know? absolutely. And people say that about a lot of celebrities, you know, it's oh, yeah. in any field, um, and I've, I've met quite a few at some big Hollywood events and things, 
And generally speaking, when you know them one on one in a in a social environment, they tend to be pretty nice people and friendly and warm. But when you throw them out into a crowd and everybody's grabbing at their shirt sleeves and you know trying to get a picture here and a word there and it's it's very difficult to live your life that way. I mean, I don't think any normal person would want to walk down the street and be dragged in 12 directions by people they don't even know. Um, she always handled it with grace, though. I, do, I will give her that. So. Now, Monty is no longer performing, correct? Correct. Um, he is having a great life retired with his family. He, Most people don't really realize this, but Monty has always been a family person very close to his parents and brothers and so he moved back to Oklahoma to be with them and you know I don't think he's ever looked back I mean occasionally who doesn't miss being on a stage but I don't think it's I think it would be more of a nostalgia and I could just be projecting um than him really going ah oh, I gave all this up I think he is super happy being where he is with his family I, th I think you're correct. I've had several conversations with him uh, through Facebook recently, and he seems to be very happy. He's back. Um, another thing that a lot of people may not know, he, he also has Cherokee roots, right? He's a, a Cherokee yes. Indian, and um, he, I believe, is living on a Cherokee reservation, correct? I believe so too, yes. I, I don't, I'm not sure, but I think you are correct. I think so, because of some of the comments he's made about having things to do regarding the Cherokee Nation, I I got the feeling that he's he's pretty immersed in the in his native culture again. And yeah. so and he seems to be very happy at that. He, in fact when we talked about doing our interview, um, he made the comment that no, I don't need to be on camera. You know, so, um, of course, he will be in video clips, but yeah. <laughs> but I think you're right. I think he's he's happy to have experienced what he did at Backstreet and touring around the country, and um, now he's he's ready to go back to, you know, a more normal life, so to speak. Yeah, it's family time. I um. Yeah, it's like, you know, he did so much in his time. He, you're right, he toured everywhere. He has several national titles. You know, he did love his grounds. But I think ultimately, and I'm almost kind of glad, you know, it's almost he retired at his peak. Right. Versus, you know, I, I think if you're going to go go big, and that was him. Right, we wouldn't want to see Monty performing at 75 years old in a wheelchair <laughs> trying to do a fire act you know that would kind of have ruined the memory yeah. of that 20 something year old doing backflips and handstands on stage and and having uh you know these flames surrounding him it, it would be it's totally different uh, yeah absolutely and uh, he certainly was a great performer so mm -hmm. now once you left backstreet you never went back into the bar industry, did you? No, I um, I literally worked at Backstreet till our final night. I was working because I also the final thing that I did there I worked the front door sale, and then the final thing I did there, in addition to the Wednesday night shows, was I worked in the gift shop and coat check downstairs. And I was working that night in the coat check when they finally came in and shut everything down the very final night. And I remember all of us that were working that night, went over with Vicky to the armory and all sat at the bar and we had a drink together, you know, it was the end of an era, so. Yeah, and that's another thing that people don't think about it anymore. You know, most of the bars these days don't have, uh, not only do they not have the family connection, because you walk into a lot of these bars and you have no idea the owner is never there or he owns eight other bars and... It's, mm -hmm. you know, impersonal, but they don't have the, the, um, gift shop and all that kind of thing that people want it. I mean, to this day, the, the I party to Backstreet group has over 10,000 members. The bar yeah. has been closed 15 years. So yeah. that says something about the long lasting legacy of Backstreet 
But even back in its day when it was open, people wanted to own a Backstreet shot glass or T-shirt or some memorabilia, and they've held on to their membership cards for decades. Yeah, it, it's it, you're right, because I still see them post that stuff in the Backstreet group on Facebook. And everybody just just has, you know, all these memories associated with them, and it's just... I think the fact that it was one of a kind and there's nothing that's been like it since and in today's environment I don't think there ever will be something like that again. Um, it just makes everyone who experienced it just want to hold on to it more. Yeah, it was, and it was an incredible experience because there were also, even though I think it was pretty much always intended to be a gay bar. Um, <laughs> But it, because of the fact that they got that 24-hour license um, for the property, it kind of evolved into a melting pot where you don't really remember necessarily being all male. It wasn't, you know, you would see women, you'd see lesbians, you would see straight people, you would see politicians, celebrities, and people of color that were not as common in the other bars. Yeah, it became that giant melting pot of everything because it it definitely evolved. Yeah, I remember when I was when I first started going there it was definitely more gay. Through the years it evolved a little bit more. Um but being twenty four hours I think also prompted that because not only did you have the people that were there from early on watching the show till five AM upstairs, but you had all this staff from other bars when they would get done come over right. and probably drag some of their clients with them too, you know, they were sitting at their bar with them. So it wasn't, I don't know, and they were, and they were like extended family too, you know, just because they were, they worked in the industry too. Yes, it was a very memorable experience. So since your days at Backstreet, since you left the bar business and started focusing more on your own musical career, where has that taken you? So, um, the place that I, that my band plays at most is Smith's Old Bar in Atlanta, you know, because, and I've said this before to, I think like years ago in an interview for one of the gay magazines, there's not really gay live music, like a gay live music venue in Atlanta. It's still drag. You know what I mean? Right. So any gay musician you got to do what you got to do in your choices. I, Smith's is my go-to place as a performer in a band to play at because they're very open to everyone and they have great energy. So that's where we perform that. Uh, this is actually the 10 year anniversary of Frisky Monkeys this year. Wow. We've been together Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's that's a, quite a milestone there for, for local yeah, talent. I, I realized that... Uh, <laughs> A couple of months ago, I was like, oh, shit, this is 10 years. <laughs> yeah. Now, you may remember this. I'm, I'm trying to, in my mind, there's a lot of blur exactly when things opened and closed in Atlanta. But Smith's Old Bar, which is basically right in Midtown anyway, it's at, at the intersection of Piedmont and Monroe, right? Correct, yep. Um, Smith's Old Bar, when I first moved to Atlanta, was known as Gene and Gabe's. Ah, uh, that's I've only only know, I've only known it as Smith's Old Bar, so that's a little before my time. And upstairs, in that building, was known as <laughs> Upstairs at Gene and Gabe's, and they did quite a number of live performances there. And they were always very open to the gay community, even back in the eighties. So oh, that nice. building has a history of supporting uh, different types of, of gay performers and uh, being more open than some of the, say, Buckhead locations might have been. Uh, yeah. And I have some very fond memories of shows at Gene and Gabe's that, um, oh, nice. you know, people that were extremely talented, some that moved on. There was one performer who did a show there. His name was Michael West. Um and he had come to Atlanta to, to do his show. He's an impersonator, uh, not a drag queen, but he would sit at the, at, his, um, at the stage, on the stage at a dressing table, 
and he would change his makeup or wig while he was talking or singing uh-huh. and he and transform into a variety of different characters whether it be Ethel Merman, Sammy Davis, Liza Minnelli, whatever voice it was. Oh wow. And he is truly a very talented um, performer and I first saw him there and he is now living in New York City and uh, I believe he has his own show up there. Um, I'm not sure if it's off-Broadway. He was also in Newsicle the Musical. Um, uh-huh. But he's, a, you know, that was the kind of talent they brought into that place. It wasn't, you know, just some local flop house that anybody who had a, you know, beat up guitar and a, and a microphone could get in there. And right. and so I'm glad to see that Smith's Old Bar is continuing that tradition. And, oh, yeah. And, you know, and the fact that you've been doing it for 10 years is pretty, you know, it's pretty amazing that the, the local community is still supporting you to the point where you're willing to and able to do it. Yeah, I, I am. I'm very fortunate. I, um, I honestly, I, I say this to my friends all the time that, you know, I, I grew up in Backstreet and without them, I don't think I would have done a lot of the things or gained the confidence to do the things that I do, like, you know, have my own band and push that forth right. into, you know, non-gay environments. But it's been awesome. As I seem to remember when um, when I first met you, that you were kind of a a tall, young, somewhat timid guy uh, with a very thick island accent, yep. <laughs> which probably made it even more difficult to connect with people because a lot of people are shallow and they if they have you know if they have to pay too much attention when you're talking they just don't pay attention at all um, mm-hmm. and I think you're right I think your experience at Backstreet and being immersed in in a culture of people who were very outgoing at least on stage um, and even though you're running the spotlight you were kind of thrown into the spotlight um, that that probably did have a big impact on your ability to do what you're doing now. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, um, you know, I never thought before that, you know, before my own show that I would ever pick up a mic other than to sing. Even that was kind of like pushing myself to be an MC, to talk, you know, that seven years doing my show gave me that natural. So even on stage now with my band, it's very easy for me to, to just be there on stage and I again I think that's all because of my experience in Backstreet you know growing up at Backstreet <laughs> so there's no doubt from you know the course of this conversation that Backstreet had a huge impact on your life not only as a gay male but also as a performer uh, and and just as a person it's it's really molded you in a lot of ways absolutely Absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I've been just talking about the entertainers, but that wasn't the only talent I was exposed to. I was exposed to the DJs, <laughs> some of the most talented people I knew, the light technicians that did their magic, so much talent. And then I got to meet so many artists that would come and perform at Backstreet, like Lonnie Gordon and Christine W. And uh, I met so many fun people. Yeah. And they were all lovely and so talented. Yeah, it was an amazing place. Um, and I've heard people recently make suggestions, oh, you should bring Backstreet back. It could never work now. It um, couldn't. It, it wouldn't. Um, you know, unless the city... No, it just wouldn't. I think it had its place and time, you know. Um, but once the city got rid of the 24-hour clubs that was it you know we were like the last holdout in that sense um but no it was a different time there was more of a sense of wonder back then i think everybody kind of knows it all now and and i don't think perhaps she would do so well in the age where everything is documented on cell phones and yeah. social media and stuff like that <laughs> because you lose that idea of your own little magic island cut away from everyone yeah I mean, when you walked in the back door um, at Backstreet, 
you were cut off from all the judgmental society outside. You had uh-huh. your own little bubble that you could do or say anything you wanted to, and nobody was really going to judge you. Um, you could... In today's terminology, you could be your authentic self, um, yeah. which we didn't necessarily understand back then. But in the 80s and 90s, it was not totally acceptable for two guys to walk hand in hand through a shopping mall and sit down at a restaurant and have dinner. Um, it was a different time. and uh, It was. And Backstreet really let you let your hair down and be who you wanted to be and be exposed to other people who could maybe identify what you wanted to be. Because you would see things that you had never seen before and say, wow, that's really cool. Maybe I should try that. And that becomes, you know, your whole scene because you were exposed to something that you had never seen or thought about before. I agree. I, I totally agree. It's, um, yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head with that. So your your music for Frisky Monkey, how would you describe that to somebody that hasn't heard you perform or hasn't listened to your tracks online? I would say um, synth pop. So think uh, along the lines of like Pet Shop Boys, Depeche Mode, Erasure, that type of electronic poppy upbeat music. Um, that's Frisky Monkey. I'm waiting for Vicky actually to respond to for her interview. Um, I've spoken to Vanessa, and Vanessa said she would she would make it happen. Um, that's cool. Do you know Vanessa? And that, that is one, yeah, that's one other thing. You kind of touched on it earlier when we were talking about things, but I, I do want to say um, that you're right. What was different about Backstreet was the owners were always there. If it was either Vicky or Henry there, sometimes both of them, and sometimes Henry's daughters, like Vanessa, so that's how I know Vanessa. It was definitely a family business. Yeah, and I don't know if you knew this, um, but they have a long history in the gay bar business that is way before Backstreet. Yeah, because they also owned Weekends, too. The very history with gay bar starts, I believe, before Vicky and Henry were even born. Their grandfather owned a very popular gay bar in Boston known as the Punch Bowl. And, of course, they've owned numerous bars as well in Atlanta including Weekends, Weekends Warehouse, La Vida's, um, Backstreet in Fort Lauderdale, and others. And that concludes another segment of the Gay Archives podcast. You can find more podcasts at gaybarchives.com slash podcast. We also have more information about this podcast and links to the other podcasts we have completed. We hope you enjoy your trip down memory lane.